Shove it, man! All right, H-A-W-K all night, all day, whatever else I like to say. It's time for the big video that I've been talking about, and you've all been patiently waiting for it. It's every TNA wrestler ever ranked. Couple of things to cover before we start. S stands for the shove it zone, and therefore, if you're in the zone, you suck. It's always been this way on the channel, and we're not changing it whether you like it or not. Second thing, I've made it so there has to be a limit that they made more than one appearance on TNA TV. Otherwise, it would get a little bit ridiculous. There may admittedly be one or two international stars that I've missed out. But make sure to yell at me in the comment section if I miss someone out. Thirdly, I've decided to grade the wrestlers for TNA up to March 2017. This is when the TNA name officially died and they became Impact. Come on, I'm not about to sit here and talk about a bunch of random nobodies from Impact alongside some of the greats of our industry. And let's be honest, most of them aren't characters you're going to be familiar with, and the Hawk isn't either. And finally, this is ranking what they did for TNA. It's not about what they went on to do somewhere else. Alright, enough talking, let's start with the Shove It Zone. Anarchia. <sighs> this guy was just bad in the ring, and he came off as a cheap cheesy version of Chavo Guerrero, a Wish version. He was so bad in the ring and just didn't know what he was doing. TNA wrestlers were said to be shocked that he even made it onto TV. Reportedly, TNA never wanted him in the first place. When they tried to form a new tag team to capture the Latino demographic, they couldn't get their main target and instead, they found this guy washing knickers for the wrestlers down in TNA Developmental. A really bad tag title reign followed. I'm still left scratching my head how he made it this far. Ace Steel It wasn't that the trainer of CM Punk was a bad wrestler. He couldn't have been. It's more of an issue of how many drugs he looked like he was on. I've never seen a wrestler look as messed up as this guy did, and when he made it to the ring, he mostly lost. He wasn't involved in any storylines, just in random X Division matches. I'd call him completely forgettable if it wasn't for those crazy eyes. Jackie Gader No idea why she was in TNA, I don't think management had any idea either. She left TNA before her only storyline could even get to the point. I know a little something that you may not think that I know. And it's some information that TNA management would love to have. And you know exactly what I'm talking about. What are you talking about? Basil Baraka and Baron Dax, the French guys. Simply horrible. I don't know why these two guys got such a push. It was possibly due to budget cuts. And you could sure tell the budget had been cut with these two guys right here. One of them looked really short and was in pretty good shape to be fair, and the other was lanky and had fangs instead of teeth. He wore the tightest black shirt anyone's ever managed to wear. How much grease did he have to coat himself in to get into that thing? Nobody was upset when TNA stopped booking the tribunal. Christian York. This character started out of a lot of promise, but quickly developed into having weird and botchy matches. Also, come on, there was enough stoner guy characters on the roster at this time. No need for Christian York. Billy Corgan. Some of the most horrible promos belong to this man. You'd think someone who plays in a well-known band would at least be able to interact with crowds on the mic, but it was horrible, and he just wasn't aesthetically pleasing either. A ref's decision is final. Games are lost and won in the fourth quarter. Not the first. Rob Terry. The worst TNA wrestler of all time due to the amount of years he was pushed for. He never had a good match or a good promo. He was literally just here because of how he looked. Which is fine, but stop putting him in matches every week. You know he sucks, so stop trying. Let him sit in the back and shoot steroids up his ass like he wants to. Toxin. They hired her to be one of the men with mohawks, but the problem was she wasn't a man, and they got rid of her after only a few shows. The Nasty Boys. No one wanted to see them back on telly in 2010. Their matches were bad, and they stuck out in TNA like sore thumbs. Devon Dudley's Kids. They got so much damn TV time it led to nothing because I don't even remember them having a single match in TNA. So what was it leading to? Beats me. A1. A big powerhouse who had no idea what he was doing in the ring. Charmel, Didn't do anything to improve the TNA show. She was Booker T's wife. Wes Briscoe. This one speaks for itself. I don't really need to explain it, do I? Brooke Hogan. Really bad. She didn't look anything like her Photoshop pictures that they used to hype her debut either. When she did debut, she looked weird and she kept falling over. She was the knockouts manager and she was somehow qualified to do that because she was the Hulkster's daughter, brother. No, I'm not going to reinstate Bully, okay?
The Blossom Twins. Twin female wrestlers who should have been TNA's answer to the Bella Twins. Unfortunately, they were charisma black holes, and not that impressive in the ring either. There was a cringy period where Dixie Carter tried to force them to have makeovers because they were too plain. Shelly Martinez. Master of one of the worst TNA matches of all time, but at least she looked good doing it. Big Vito. I don't really remember him in TNA, but I do know he only stunk around for a month. Yeah, I said stunk, not stuck, and I meant it. Aiden O'Shea. He had size and a clothesline for a finisher. He was the new Bradshaw. Except he wasn't, and they gave him silly gimmicks where he wore hats and suspenders. Snitsky. He was only in TNA briefly to annoy the former ECW crowd in New York. Personally, I could have done without Snitsky on my telly. Mahabali Shira. Don't get me started on this lump. It was always going to be tough for Shira not speaking the language and also not knowing how to wrestle, but Shira did pretty well out of TNA. He got a US visa, he got to be on TV each week, he got free steroids. Unfortunately, TNA didn't get much out of him though. The gifted Glenn Gilberti. How is he gifted, I hear you say? Well, I don't know. I'm still trying to figure that out 20 years later. Tried to push him as a main eventer, but no one was buying it. Garrett Bischoff. Another example of a character that the show tried to turn into a success for way too long. It was all down to nepotism, and he didn't belong on the show. The Rock and Roll Express. Didn't do much in TNA, apart from somehow looked like everyone's grandmas. Black Rain. A dark time in the career of Goldust. Terry Taylor, a stooge who no one has anything nice to say about. Val Venus, when he turned up in 2010, he was bold, overweight and out of place in TNA. He beat Christopher Daniels and then he left. Eric Bischoff, where do I start with the leader of the Grey Crew? Because I do want to try and keep this short. As a character, he had more camera time than any of the wrestlers. His promos were so long and boring that the TNA show ran over time on a weekly basis. Aside from that, he's extremely negative about TNA and refuses to accept any of the blame for the company's downfall. Tyrus. There's just nothing positive to say about this guy. Rikishi. Saw TNA as a second-rate company and treated it that way. At least he wasn't trying to pretend. Crystal Lashley. Came across as someone who really didn't want to be in TNA and mostly bitched about things. A really dislikable character. King. Lost almost all his matches without barely throwing a punch. Eddie Kingston in TNA was not a success story. Nux. A jobber in the Aces and Eights group. Never had a good match and it was a waste of time. Winter. Did a weird zombie, lesbian, vampire time travelling gimmick with Angelina Love. She also won the knockouts title a couple of times and I still have no idea why. Tito Ortiz. Appeared in TNA several times over the years, with each appearance getting worse. His 2013 Aces and H run was the real highlight as TNA hyped the debut of a new character, and it was him. Complete silence followed. Okada. Look, it's not his fault, but this character was horrible. He mostly got beaten up by the Pope and carried Samurjo's bags. It was so bad that New Japan ceased their working arrangement with TNA for several years over it. <laughs> Who are you? Let's find out who's the man behind the mask. I don't like the way you look. Put the mask back on. Put it back on. Put the mask back on. Damn. Cody Dina, a hillbilly who might have been okay for a couple of shows, but he just wouldn't go away. <laughs> Jesse Godders. Another guy was just given so many chances due to how he looked, but he just came off like a douche whatever he did. Not as bad as Rob Terry as he did manage to slightly improve in the ring. Jessica Havoc. Her first run in TNA was simply horrendous and the fans didn't want to see this woman push down their throats. Basham and Damager. TNA fans didn't want to see them either and they were gone as quickly as they arrived. Alpha female. There was big hype for this woman debuting in TNA. Pretty soon it was realised the hype was for nothing and she was a poor fit. Lady Tapa. She had a look and that was it. She was shoved down our throats for ages. She also lost her gut check match but was given a contract still anyway which didn't even make sense to me at the time. In actuality TNA had already signed up before the match took place. So it was rigged then.
Karen Jarrett, the bitch wife of Slapnut. She got way too much time on telly, but I guess she was a good heel because she was extremely hateable. Lex Luger. He only ever seemed to exist in TNA because of Slapnuts and Sting. He was still a WCW character. Just incredible. Had some horrible hardcore matches with Jerry Lynn in the early days and then he left. All it did was reduce Jerry Lynn's status in the company. It's killer, spelt backwards. Do it and then you'll get a smack afterwards. King Mo. More like King No. This guy remained on the roster for years despite never actually showing up. It was weird. Possibly a money laundering scheme. Alex Silva. Only got signed by TNA when Ric Flair went off script and voted to give Silva a contract. He was never that good and turned out to be a criminal too. Gangrel. Oh look, it's Gangrel. I remember him from the Attitude Era. I wonder what he's doing in TNA. Oh, never mind. He's gone again. Norman Smiley. Is that seriously Norman Smiley's wife? There was a drop storyline where Smiley's wife was protecting him from getting beaten up and they were never seen again in TNA. Why? What? Why? Orlando Jordan. Just no. His TNA run made me want to gouge my eyes out. Murphy. What kind of a name is Murphy? You know you failed when your name is Murphy. Jim Duggan. This character was consistent and he just carried on doing what he'd been doing for the last 20 years. The same tired, stale, boring act. Bart Gunn. Turned up for one episode of TNA. They made a big deal out of him and then he was gone again. Brandy Rhodes. Extremely cringy in TNA. She called herself Minnie Moose and screamed out her name before every move. I still feel sick watching this back after all these years. I might be Big Moose around here, but you're definitely Minnie Moose. Good job tonight. Minnie Moose. <laughs> <laughs> <Mini Moose. laughs> Ezekiel Jackson. Big Zeke was only here to annoy the former ECW fans in New York. I wasn't even there and I felt annoyed too. Cookie. A mouthy Jersey Shore inspired character who brought nothing to the show. Marche Rocket. For some reason this guy was hailed as the next X Division great despite being closer to six foot. He wasn't particularly athletic either, so what was he doing in the X Division? I have no idea. Rebby, the bitch wife of Matt Hardy. She gets a free pass nowadays because everyone loves the Hardy Boys, but it doesn't take away from the fact that she's still a horrible person. Party Marty. Marty Skrull made it to TNA, but when he arrived, I guess Marty Party too hard and he was gone quickly. Nobody cared. Chris Melendez. Shoved down everyone's throat because he was an army guy with his leg blown off in the war, and therefore he wrestled on one leg. That in itself is commendable, but all that followed was a bunch of matches where wrestlers were obsessed with stealing his prosthetic leg. Why did they want it so badly? I don't get it. The Rainbow Express. Cringy portrayal of homosexual people in wrestling. Then it went weird when it turned out that Alan Funk wasn't actually gay. Rosie Lotterlove. A big woman who was green, but also acted like a diva from the Attitude Era. She also injured other wrestlers, so not a good time with her. Well, you put Daphne on the disabled list. Rosie was very dominant to the point that, well, folks, you haven't seen Daphne in quite a while because, to be honest, Rosie put her on injured reserve. Iceberg. Turned up on TV for a couple of weeks and then disappeared. I can't say we missed out on much because the match he did have was bad. Simon Diamond. Nobody wanted to see the Diamond Man in TNA, and when he started a faction called the Diamonds in the Rough, the only question I had was what qualifies this man to lead his own faction and give out advice? Machete. The original guy in LAX. He's always forgotten about because he sucks. Didn't seem like a street thug, he was just kind of goofy. Humble beginnings for LAX. Raka Khan. She had a really great look, and that was about it. A bad wrestler who had even worse backstage attitude. Some job a bolt. She seemed like a nice girl, who unfortunately shouldn't have been in the spot that she was challenging for the title. She botched a lot. The Harris twins. Were they really racist? It's not for me to say. I can't see inside their heads. Certainly enough people think they were. But aside from that, they were the most boring wrestlers of all time who found regular employment due to their friendship with Russo and Jarrett. The Dups. Responsible for some of the wackiest, weirdest early TNA segments. These characters were hillbillies, but they were crazier than any hillbilly you'd ever met. 
Everything they did made no sense, and they were more suited to being part of the Howard Stern Show. Ed Ferrara Started out as a commentator in TNA, and then he was gone. Continued to act like he did in the WCW, doing things that rub people the wrong way. You want to get into a fight with these two guys? It's like it's like running in the Special Olympics. Even if, you, even if you win, you got to be retarded to do it. Unbelievable. At a, at a moment like this, that's the reference that you're going to make. David Flair. This could have been a second chance for David Flair, but he just looked completely out of his depth at this point. He was there in the first year and quickly disappeared without doing anything of note. Peyton Banks, possibly the most forgettable female character in the history of TNA. Shane Sewell, also known as Shane Stool, a referee turned wrestler. It took ages to get to the point of him being a wrestler, and when he did, he was gone. China, well past it and was really sad seeing her in this state during her few appearances. Gregory Shane Helms. You'd think the Hurricane could do something cool for TNA. Instead, all he did was manage his team, which didn't seem like they belonged on such a big stage in the first place. Mark Haskins. The UK talent had a lot of hype surrounding him, but he choked on the biggest stage and botched and was never seen again. Pi Delta Slam. A fat guy tag team who first appeared in ECW. They were unable to connect with the TNA fans and they were gone. Then they were back again as security guards and you just know how much I love those sort of gimmicks. Triturn, a man who thought he was the Terminator. Sadly, he wasn't, and this character didn't get any further development and it remains one of those low-key characters lost to time. So that finishes up the Shove It Zone. I didn't expect the zone to be so full it's starting to groan. Also, a lot of really bad tag team gimmicks in there. Did anyone else notice that? We move on to the D crew. Jesse Neal. He wasn't as bad as people like to make out. The man with the mohawk did get some good crowd reactions when he was on offense, and he wasn't overused. Ivelis Velez had a pretty decent gut check match and should have received a TNA contract. We were all left scratching our heads when she didn't, probably due to her backstage attitude. She managed to get everyone hyped for her, even though she only appeared on a couple of TNA shows. Rebel, another wrestler who was really only in TNA for her looks. She did prove to be pretty popular with the audience though, so I can't knock her too much. She was pretty much abysmal in the ring though, which I can knock her for. Tommy Dreamer. Anytime he was on camera, he was crying. His character has to be the most whining, whinging loser of all time. It was admittedly cool to see the ECW guys in TNA at first, but it got old quickly, just like their real life ages. Then you realise that almost all of them had nothing to offer. Perry Saturn. His TNA stay was too brief, but he had a couple of cool matches during his quick stay. Bill Alfonso. Didn't really do much but blur his whistle. I don't know what I was expecting. Bill Alfonso! <laughs> Alex Kozlov. Literally don't remember this guy except he would do a weird dance that looks out of place in a wrestling ring. Brian Kendrick. He had the chance to show more of his The Brian Kendrick character from the WWE. Instead, he decided to go down a really weird route where he read books, prayed, and meditated in the corner. Fans found it difficult to connect with his weirdness. My vibrational frequencies are too high for that. You feed off of fear. My zero point is a great distance from fear. What you are is low vibrational reptilians. Paul Bearer cut a good but weird promo and then disappeared. Jimmy Yang. This grade should be a lot higher for a man who was on the first TNA show. He was a flying Elvis and he was the best in the ring out of the three. He never managed to gain much traction in TNA because he kept wrestling internationally. A shame because the show missed him. Trevor Murdoch. He was just in TNA to do the J.O.B. It was pretty quick too, so I don't have much to say. Except this is technically a double inclusion because he was also one of the dubs. I don't know why I've included him twice. Shove it. Delirious. This ROH legend only ever showed up in TNA to lose matches and act crazy. He was never involved in any storylines, and for someone with such a jarring character, he shouldn't jar the TNA audience. Crimson. I'm not going to put Crimson in the turd zone, because I do believe he had some redeeming qualities. Yes, his push as the new undefeated Goldberg was a bit ridiculous, but I think his personality was likeable, and he did improve a bit over the years. It was just all a giant waste of time, mind. Al Snow. Why was Al Snow the manager of the random French guys? It made no sense. I'm not even sure Al Snow could speak French. 
There must have been something better you could do with this legend. Braxton Sutter. The boy in the beanie had a decent look and average ring skills. His character was one that ladies wanted, but he didn't want that. <laughs> and the crowd didn't particularly want him either. Bullet Bob. The father of Road Dog wrestled and cut promos a fair bit in the early days. My main gripe is that whenever he was on screens, he made the show feel incredibly dated and not a state-of-the-art upcoming promotion. He was just a poor fit. We can fix this. No matter what you think, it's never too late to try. We can mm, fix can this. Fix 2006 could be our year. But it's all about family. Hogan. Yes, this might surprise some of you that he's not gone in the zone. I have my reasons. First of all, he wasn't as annoying as Bischoff. Hogan regularly missed TNA shows due to his back problems, so he didn't get repetitive to the point that he wanted to smash your TV in. Fans did want to see Hogan, and he was still a draw. His match with Sting was a spectacle depending on how you look at it. At times, Hogan worked with the younger guys too and tried to make them into stars. No one was buying it though. I doubt Hogan was even buying it. You're as quick on your feet as you are with your mouth and with your thinking. And that's why you're where you're at today is because you're a visionary. Jimmy Hart. He did what Jimmy Hart always does. Hypes his main man, the Hulkster. Mandrews. I liked Mandrews, but I think overall he turned out to be a disappointment for TNA. They devoted a fair amount of time to him, but he never had that amazing match to cement his legacy in TNA. Also, a skater gimmick in 2016? Come on. Andrew Everett. Similar to Mandrews, but possibly worse because his look was bad. He didn't really look like he belonged on TV. Despite that, he could pull off some pretty impressive moves. Aaron Rex. When signing from the WWE, everyone said how much WWE had missed out on this guy. Then WWE were proved right when Rex did nothing in TNA. He started playing this Liberace gimmick and then he left before it even went anywhere. A real time waster. Steve Carino. He was part of this mini ECW invasion of TNA in 2003. He had a couple of passable matches and then he left. The Road Warriors. People went nuts when the Road Warriors came to TNA. They shouldn't have bothered because they were gone after two shows. Mick Foley. I want to believe that Mick tried his best for TNA, but ultimately turned everything involving him into bad comedy. His run of matches also showed that he was well past his best at this point. I'm going to go to the back and my thoughts are going to be where they should be on Jeff Jarrett. Thank you very much. Bram. He had a scary look and an accent that nobody could understand. Seemed like they wanted to do something with him, but they never did. Johnny Devine. He was just involved in way too many stupid things in TNA, which harmed his character overall. Tajiri. He was just in TNA because they did Bound for Glory in Japan that year, and that was a terrible show by the way. Taylor Hendricks. I'm not going to blame her, she seemed like she could be the next star knockout, had personality and looks. Also possibly she had a bad attitude to go along with it. Shane Douglas. Did nothing to move past his time in 1996 ECW, a man who was truly living on the past success, but he should have been able to do more. Mia Yim. Hailed as the second coming of Gail Kim, and I don't think she was ever really able to shake off those comparisons. She was definitely fine in the ring, but she was nowhere near the rounded star that Gail Kim was. Joey Ryan. Everyone's favourite Joey Ryan came into TNA with a decent storyline. He'd been rejected a contract by Al Snow and started a feud with him. This was during an era where people actually liked Joey Ryan. Also, he had a weird homoerotic tag team with Matt Morgan, but that didn't go anywhere either. Big Morgan and the Big Organ are gonna win the gold and show everybody that size matters. Lacey Von Erich. She probably belongs in the turd zone, and I'll give you that, but the Hoke has a soft spot for Lacey, and I ain't dumping. After watching her entire run, she did have an entertaining personality, and she was trying to improve in the ring. She was appalling at first, though, granted. Mike Awesome, couple of cool spots and he was gone. The Sandman, spent most of his time in TNA losing. His entrance was usually longer than his matches. He just hung out with the other ECW guys reliving old times. Billy Gunn, did nothing to show that he should have been a main event in the WWF. He just seemed pretty sour about them mostly. See, somebody has to put you in your place and that's gonna be me. <laughs> that's just keeping it real. Chavo Guerrero. He had some good tag matches, but I strongly objected to his whole character being that Eddie was his uncle and therefore he deserved to be TNA World Champion. Chavo Guerrero is here to beat the best. It's time for Chavo Guerrero to be a champion right here 
here in Impact Wrestling. It just rubbed me the wrong way. Roddy Piper. A fire promo against Russo and he was gone again. What was the point? It was good telly, but nothing came of it. Sabu. Some good matches in TNA for Sabu, but his appearances with the company were so inconsistent it was hard to get any serious rivalries going with the character. Grado. As someone who followed Grado before his TNA run, I get what went wrong here. A lot of Grado's popularity came from his ability to dance and choreograph stuff to famous songs. Unfortunately, TNA couldn't use those famous songs and we were stuck with a watered down comedy character. The US audience never seemed to connect with him the way the UK audience did. Test. Looked like a complete nutcase in TNA for one match. Rashad Cameron. Here's someone I've literally never mentioned before. He came in as TNA tried to reboot their X division. All I really remember about him was his trash talking on the way to the ring. His look was okay too. Doc. I still don't understand what everyone sees in this guy. He's basically a harass to him without the racism allegations. Robbie E. A complete goofball who was scared of clowns. He was pushed for years over far more deserving wrestlers, but as a character he put his all into his Jersey Shore gimmick and it's one of the more memorable things from TNA, even if it did get annoying. Brittany. She was hot, but she wanted Samuel Shaw, which was a big turn off. Didn't stick around for long. Booker T. Just another guy who seemed to be in TNA just to collect a final paycheck and saw them and treated them as a second rate company. Certainly wasn't worth whatever they paid him. Psychosis. Another guy who wrestled on the very first TNA show, and the second one, then he was gone for two years. Nothing he did was particularly memorable, but that match on the second TNA show was good so I'll give him a pass. Paul London. Kept randomly popping up in TNA during the early years, to have random X Division matches, and seemed like TNA wanted to do something with this character. Unfortunately he never stuck around on the show long enough for us to find out. Dakota Darso. Was a part of some good matches, and then left. I barely remember him. Nothing flashy, it's not pretty. It's well, you know what, Dakota, unfortunately, the X Division is about flashy. And sometimes it's about pretty. Sin. Became a tag team in the new church with Father James Mitchell for a bit, and it was fine. Taz. Extremely funny on commentary, but I don't think he was a trade-up. Spent more time making fun of the wrestlers and perving on the knockouts. Great fun, but made the show look stupid at times. Raquel. Not actually that bad and was improving. Christy Hemi. She was fine but not worth the money she was paid. She certainly wasn't worth more money than the other knockouts. Marty Bell. Nothing too offensive here. She wasn't particularly great or memorable though. Madison Rain. Yes, I did resist the urge to put her in the zone. Remember, I'm a much more positive hoke nowadays. Her in-ring stuff sucked and she was small and it was unbelievable. As a character, I guess she played a whiny heel quite well and she was confident enough on the mic and that's the most praise I'll ever give to her. Moving on. Johnny Swinger. Just had to change of channel heat for me. A complete goofball. Kiyoshi. I barely remember anything he did except there was a faction one day and he was in it and then he was gone the next. Vampiro. Had high hopes for Vamp after he did quite well in the dying days of WCW. He just didn't do a whole lot in TNA to keep his momentum going. Jorge Estrada. One of the free flying Elvises. This guy was pretty athletic in the ring and had a decent look. He just disappeared not long after, reportedly with some legal troubles. Shocker. Shocker. More like shocking. Nah, I'm kidding. He wasn't that bad. He was just never the star that TNA made him out to be just because he appeared in some McDonald's commercials. I prove myself to all the Mexican fans for the past 12 years. All the American fans, the number one, and all the fans from TNA, who's going to be the next exhibition champion? Mikey Bats, just a regular job guy in TNA. Easy to pretend he never existed. Micah, a complete failure for TNA. I'm not sure he even hit a single move. He came in as part of Drew McIntyre's faction, The Rising, who I like to call The Failing. Trevor Lee. He was a caveman or something. His gimmick felt really out of place in TNA. He was also talked up as being the strongest guy in the company, whilst Lashley was a part of the company. I'm not even joking. Brian Lee. He started out as a member of James Mitchell's New Church. He was fine as a tag guy, pretty forgettable though. He started to get over by doing Rick Steiner's barking gimmick, but then he left TNA. The Hot Shots. 
squeezed their junk on the early TNA shows. It wasn't a gimmick that lasted long as they became a normal tag team. Normal with a depressed Shane Douglas. We're pricks! We're proud! And we are protruding! Easy Money I was hyped to see Easy Money as he was fun during ECW and WCW. Unfortunately his TNA run was a letdown. They pushed him for a few weeks then he was forgotten about. Eric Watts I think he was supposed to be a wrestler but he ended up being more of a TNA authority figure who occasionally wrestled. I have no idea why he got so much screen time. Tonight I'm going to carry your dead carcass around the ring because it's just as simple. You suck and I'm tired of you. Joe E. Legend he looked like a twin of Eric Watts, which didn't help because they were both in TNA at the same time. A decent wrestler who had some weird character tendencies. His catchphrase of no, no, no pretty much summed up how I felt when I saw him on telly. No, no, no. Great American folk hero, Jeff Jarrett. Is Jeff Jarrett smarter than me? No, no, no. Pac-Man Jones. Contrary to what you think, I found his run as a tag team champion fairly entertaining. He wasn't allowed to actually wrestle for TNA, so instead they came out of unique ways to take his opponents out, usually involving a football. He didn't stick around long enough for the act to get stale. Right? Yes, sir. First of all, I want to shout out to all my Titan teammates as I count my days down, returning back to the NFL. I came, I saw, I conquered. Adam Pac-Man Jones and Ron and Truth have came together like a hand in the glove. Lex love it. Well, I sure didn't love it. ICP. Their run was too short for anything crazy to happen. We are just mere moments away from absolute catastrophe. Teddy Hart. Had some good matches in the World X Cup, but had backstage problems and his aggression caused him to not make it any further in TNA. Don Callis. I can't remember him doing a single thing. Possibly he was part of a revolving door of authority figures. Josh Matthews. He was just a sign that the show was on a downturn and he came across as a massive dork. The Briscoes. They only wrestled sporadically for TNA. I was more taken back by how skinny they both looked. Despite what they'd go on to do, I don't think they're ready for TV at this point. Great Muta. He wrestled briefly for TNA in 2014 as they were going to Japan. It was great to see him again, but he was now very old and very slow. PJ Black. He received a push for a couple of weeks, even winning the King of the Mountain title as part of the Global Fast Wrestling Faction. Then he was gone again. A bizarre push. Tracy Brooks. I originally had her in the turd zone, but moved her up a place due to her sort of legendary status in TNA. Let me be clear, the stuff she was doing was just pure diva stuff from the Attitude Era. In fact, I'm pretty sure some of the stuff she was involved in set the women back a couple of years. But she did become a consistent on-screen character in a sort of knockout management role. Brian Cage. How do you not sign Brian Cage? It was still a mystery that TNA passed on this guy. You have to wonder if it was something to do with a backstage problem, because you'd have been a complete moron not to sign him. And that concludes the D zone. Now as we move into the C section, we're talking about pregnancies. But we're also talking about people who definitely contributed to the TNA show. And they made some sort of lasting impression. But at the same time, there was something that let them down a bit. Bob Backlund. A comedy character who hung around backstage in TNA for seemingly no reason. I guess when your name is Bob Backlund, you can do whatever you want. He had some fun for you to the X Division geeks. Conad. I don't want to go too hard on all Conad, but he was about as much used to TNA as Long John's to an Instagram butt model. He was too beaten up to wrestle and he was mostly just a manager for LAX. He could still cut fire promos, which is why he's in the C tier. Matt Seidel. He was just a jobber in 2003, but he managed to show off his potential during his brief ring time. Taryn Terrell. They did this storyline that she was a referee and then it went on forever. When she finally learned to be a wrestler in storyline terms, nobody was looking forward to it. She was supposed to be a bad wrestler. Then she proved everybody wrong with a couple of decent matches, but didn't really do anything else after them. Juventud Guerrera. It's always fun when the juice shows up. Sienna. 
A decent addition to the TNA knockouts. She never managed to rise above average, though. Judas Macias. I enjoyed Macias in TNA. Unfortunately, it didn't last long, but he did look legitimately scary. Kenny King. A mixed bag for Kenny King. His promos and character work were always strong, but he often let himself down in the ring where he could be a bit of a botch master. Suicide. A wrestler created in a video game somehow became a real-life wrestler. This guy was hyped through the roof. Unfortunately, the marketing machine couldn't stop his matches from being nothing but average. He was never involved in any storylines, and past his cool entrance, there wasn't that much to him. He was portrayed by a few different wrestlers over time. Jimmy Rave. Unfortunately, Jimmy was better in ROH, where he was pushed as a more serious threat. In TNA, he was mostly used as a punchline. His ring work was always impressive, though. Rest in peace, Jimmy Rave. It's Jimmy Rave, and I'm ready to get this match over with so we can party! Woo! Naito and Yujiro. The team on loan from New Japan weren't treated too badly by TNA. At least they weren't made to do anything stupid. They wore hats for some reason, I guess they're cool guys. Had a few decent matches and then left without anyone remembering they were there in the first place. On reflection, neither of them wore hats. I don't know where I got that from. I'm sorry, but it's still a C though. Ali. Excellent character work that built up to Ali learning how to wrestle. Unfortunately, once she learned how to wrestle, nobody wanted to see her. The whole storyline dragged on for what felt like years. I'm sorry, Mrs. Maria! Louder! I'm sorry, Miss Maria! The Naturals. Whilst I'm not personally a fan of the team, I know a lot of people are. They were consistent members of the tag division and put on good matches, no complaints. Zach Gowan. The matches this one-legged wonder had in TNA were pretty fun. He didn't hang around for very long though. So Cal Val, a fun ring valet and interviewer. The highlight of her stay was when New Jack and Mustafa cut a promo with her. You know what they say about black men, right? What? Once you go black, you get bad credit. Samuel Shaw, the most successful wrestler to come out of TNA's gut check program. He showed excellent character work, but also had some of the most boring matches of all time. Rick Steiner, he was never in TNA consistently, but when he turned up, everyone went nuts for him. RVD. I just think Rob Van Dam turned out to be a bit of a waste of money. He wasn't particularly bad, but he was just average and he spent a lot of time looking cranky. I think TNA hoped they were getting a main event to take them to the next level. Instead, the only thing Rob was taking was a paycheck. TJ Perkins. He actually had a few separate runs with the company. Unfortunately, nobody wanted to see him being TJ Perkins. They liked to cover his face with a mask, which I think is a bit weird because he isn't particularly ugly. Rhino. Am I being harsh putting Rhino here? He was good enough in the ring, but I just feel like he spent most of his run looking a bit stupid in dumb angles. Umaga. He wrestled in TNA as ECMO Jr. He wasn't there for very long, but he looked like a real force and had some good matches. The Road Dog. One of the big early names to join TNA. Unfortunately, he didn't have much to offer. He ended up doing the Free Live Crew, which suited him just fine. Free Live Crew, we be dropping like bang! Free Live Crew, we still be getting rowdy! Did you hear that fizzle fizzle? Chelsea Green. At first she was a hot bratty girl. That didn't last long because she was left at the altar and she became a full-time drunk bride. It was good character work but it dragged on way too long and it made the match quality suffer. Somehow she became Knockouts Champion around this time too. Anthony Nice. This guy looked like a young Tommy Dreamer on steroids. They used him a few times as they tried to relaunch the X Division in 2011 and he had some good matches. Not much else to say. Zima Ion. He had a hairspraying gimmick which got old really fast. He was a pretty exciting X Division guy, but he never seemed to do much else. Then he got really annoying and became a DJ. The less said about that run, the better. Go for a bro down, go for a bro down! Oh, and they nail it! The double team move! And your winners! To the surprise of nobody! It's that crippled jackass, Jesse Sorensen, but I'm pretty effing dangerous. S.A. Rios. Didn't actually do much in TNA, was only there for the World X Cup tournaments. The matches were fun, so he's got that going for him. Matt Morgan. TNA pushed Matt Morgan multiple times as a main event, but he could never quite do it. I don't hate Matt Morgan. There were actually times when I wish TNA had just pulled the trigger with him and let him kick ass like a giant should do. In retrospect, he should probably have been the guy to take out the Aces and Eights, but he was derailed by Hogan, who Morgan was scared of. 
Kevin Mash. C or B? C or B? Yeah, I struggled to decide, but ultimately settled on a C. Nash was probably the funniest character in TNA history. There's honestly too many storylines and segments, so I'll just shout out Paparazzi Productions, a storyline where he was trying to create characters for the X Division geeks. I just don't think Nash was worth what TNA paid him. I'm kind of busy tonight. Doing what? Well, what I do best, sit around, do nothing, get paid. <laughs> Actually, I know where you can get a partner. Where? Down there. Down where? Larry Zabisco. This legend mostly played an authority figure, but he was a pretty fun one as he was happy to make himself look stupid on telly. He did wrestle some matches too against the likes of Raven and AJ Styles. The one against Styles was actually good considering his age. Ken Shamrock. The very first NWA TNA Heavyweight Champion, and that's about it. He won the belt, had a couple of below average matches and then dropped the belt and was gone. He really wasn't anything special in TNA, but I put this character in the C section due to his historical value to the company. Tomko. He was actually pretty good when he first arrived he spent a lot of time hanging around Christian, AJ and Kurt. He was even a tag team champion. Unfortunately he got out of shape really quickly in TNA. The Wolves. Some people would give them an A, I personally wouldn't. For me they marked the downturn in TNA's fortunes. When they showed up the show felt smaller. The crowds felt smaller and nobody was watching. They had some great matches, but they didn't appeal to TNA's established audiences who expected some fun character work and storylines to go along with the matches. Jackie Moore. She didn't wrestle that much in TNA, she was mostly a manager for America's Most Wanted. This meant she ended up drunk a few times on TV. Unfortunately, I don't remember her doing much else. She was with the company for a few years, somehow. Do you hear what those two bimbo hoes were talking about? Something about budging in the bedroom or something. Hey, partner! Yeah! Cheers! <laughs> she just poured beer all over me. I don't care. Do you know who that is? That's Miss Jackie. She's a veteran. Hey, She's Jackie. hammered. Jackie, Please. I'm gonna go get Please. her more of this. Good, great. Go get her more beer. Crazy Steve. Did pretty well as a tag guy in the decay, despite his very small size. His clown gimmick was pretty different to anything else in mainstream wrestling at the time. Mr. Perfect. Look, this run wasn't perfect, but it was fun for the short time he was in TNA and he did some entertaining shoot promos, mostly targeted at Brock Lesnar. I run out of beer in the bus, but I got Brock Lesnar buying me some more at the liquor store. Taking down Brock Lesnar at 35,000 feet? Priceless! Raven. This should have been Raven's big chance to show the other companies what they missed out on. He started well, but he was a victim of slap nuts. Seemed to age really quickly in TNA too. Dusty Rhodes. Played an authority figure who still had matches. The less said about his matches, the better, but he lived up to his expected character qualities. Stevie Richards. Tried to do a doctor character on TV, so props to try something new. Unfortunately, it was incredibly stupid. Everyone knew Stephen Richards from the WWF and not some crazy doctor. X Pac. When he showed up to work, he could put on some excellent matches. Unfortunately, he didn't always show up. Sometimes he showed up high, but it's fine because he's the X Pac we all know and love. DDP. Not bad, not great. At least gave you a reason to watch TNA in the early days as he was one of the few legit stars they could get. Brother Devon. He was fine when he was doing Team 3D, but when they broke up and he wrestled singles matches, he was found out. It showed that he was much less talented than the other half of Team 3D. Brother Spike. He took some pretty insane bumps in TNA, but he wasn't really there that long. Scott Damore. Probably had a bit too much mic time, but played an obese heel really well as he led his Team Canada. He knew how to get under your skin. Drew Galloway. I've never been a fan of McIntyre, but maybe some of you would give him a B, and that's fine, I can accept that. It's just not my cup of tea. Jesse Sorensen. This guy had some potential before Zima Ion crashed down on his neck. Yeah, I like Jesse Sorensen, he was great. Rosita. She really didn't do much in TNA. She looked very small, but had a somewhat fun team with her storyline cousin. MVP. He didn't do much wrestling in TNA because he was injured. He tried to do one of the many takeover angles in TNA where he was taken over from Dixie. He was a good mouthpiece. Todd Kennelly. Not a bad announcer at all, but his geeky personality rubbed Taz the wrong way. Magnus. First he was bad, then he was okay, then he was bad again. He's often vilified for being the one that was pushed after AJ Styles left. 
The name's Brutus Magnus, but despite the incorrect introduction, it's lovely to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Yeah, ooh, feisty one. CM Punk. The crowd mostly chanted, we want Pepsi. I think his tattoo was actually more over than him in TNA. He was pretty good in the ring, but not a whole lot else to say from Punk's time in TNA. Creed. Wasn't with TNA for very long, but I do remember that one time he projectile sprayed after getting spiked. A real highlight for the future New Day man. Mr. Anderson. A disappointment in TNA. It all started so well when he feuded with Kurt Angle. You could mostly skip the rest of his TNA run, as it was 90% bad comedy. I wanted him to show the WWE what they missed out on, but I don't think he ever succeeded. He was just average. Sorry about my damn breath! <laughs> you think this is funny, don't you? <laughs> Gunnar. Mr. Intensity did manage to outgrow being a security guard, fortunately. Unfortunately, his only personality was being so intense that his nappy was probably filled with turds on a daily basis. Tigre Uno. I barely remember this guy, but I will say he's someone that looked like someone who could do some crazy moves, but he never actually did any, so that makes him a disappointment. Davari. He played the part of a racist who hates Americans, but says they're racist to him. Similar to his WWE stuff, he did draw heat from the crowd, but it got old quickly. Mike Sanders. First I hated Mike Sanders and called him beyond boring. Then I started to find him somewhat amusing, and then as soon as that happened he disappeared from the show. A shame, his character had some potential. The SATs. <sighs> you know... Despite these guys looking so similar, they weren't actually twins, but they were brothers. They had a major lack of personality, but they were pretty good in the ring. They didn't actually stick around for very long, which would have given them a higher grade if they did. D-Ray 3000. A pretty underrated guy in the ring who was stuck in a comedy gimmick. Vince Russo. I'm speaking from a character point of view here and not as a writer. Russo probably took up too much TV time in the Asylum era, but to his credit his promos were never boring. I just struggled to see the sense or point in a lot of them. He would have a feud on the mic with someone from the Attitude Era and then they'd be done with TNA. A waste of time, but sometimes a good waste of time. David Young, the master of the cab driver slam, suffered from too many comedy gimmicks and being laughed at on TV on a weekly basis. It's a shame because this guy could actually go in the ring. Instead, he spent most of his time losing. Malice, formerly the wall in WCW. In TNA, he looked larger than life and scary as hell. For a few weeks, he seemed like he was going to be the guy. Sadly, he passed away too soon. Apollo. The Puerto Rican was always touted as a potential main eventer. Unfortunately, he couldn't speak good English. That didn't stop TNA for trying with him multiple times, though. Michael Shane. I like this guy. It's a shame he could never move out of the spotlight being Shawn Michaels' cousin, and TNA was certainly to blame for that. Jason Cross. Could have been like AJ Styles. Instead, he wasn't like AJ Styles, and he drifted off into irrelevance. Jarrell Clark. He would enter a match, do something really cool, and then disappear. A real flash in the pan kind of wrestler. Cody Rhodes. Wasn't there that long, but carried himself like a star and gave people a reason to watch as he set about on his quest to become the man he is today. Chris Candido. A fun character who was always acting as a manager for the Naturals. A real loss to wrestling. Tony Mamaluke. A weedy looking guy who actually had some good X Division matches in the Asylum era. Roderick Strong. He just did his ROH gimmick. He did some backbreakers and then he left. Tanahashi. I don't really remember him, but I'm sure it was great. Quinton Rampage Jackson. For an MMA guy who was just there to promote his fight with Tito Ortiz, he was actually decent and carried himself like a star whilst he was in the main event mafia. I didn't hate it. Francine. She was only there for the first couple of shows, but she sure left an impression on the young hawk. Kid Romeo. Why wasn't this guy in wrestling longer? He was really good. North Furnham and Dewey Barnes. A fun comedy act who did a lot to help establish EC3 as a main eventer. They were nerds, but they played nerds perfectly. And finally, the last minute inclusion is Moose. Somehow I forgot he existed in TNA at this point, despite covering him as part of Brandy Rhodes' bit. I like Moose, but he's never quite achieved as much as I hoped he would. Moose. 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 So that's some pretty interesting guys in there that should have gone a lot further with the company. 
Now we move on to the B section, which contains wrestlers who are important parts of the TNA programming, be that through supporting the company in its early days or consistently performing well throughout the years. In some cases, TNA would just be plain weird without some of the following people. Jeff Hardy I toyed for hours and hours on whether a Jeff deserved to be in the A tier. I lost sleep over it, it was a difficult choice to make. Jeff devoted a lot of years to TNA and had some great matches, but the whole being drugged up at Victory Road thing would always overshadow anything else he did. He made TNA look like a joke and he pissed me off. It wasn't his only incident in TNA either. There comes a time when the Hawk says enough is enough. Daphne She deserved so much in wrestling. This crazy goth chick became a hardcore wrestler in TNA and she helped show a completely different aspect to woman wrestlers. Unfortunately, she put her body on the line a bit too much and it would ultimately lead to her passing. Frankie Kazarian An excellent wrestler who joined TNA in the early years. Despite being nicknamed the future, he never quite lived up to his nickname. He was always paired with people who were slightly better than him, which is unfortunate, because Kaz would finally show us all what we'd been missing in the later stages of his career. Jay Lethal Lethal is great, but... Oh, I'm gonna get some hate for this. Other than his Ric Flair feud, what has he done in TNA? He had some of the worst X Division tart reigns of all time, struggled to find a character and gimmick, and had standard high flyer matches. I like him, I just don't love him. It looks like the horsemen were here, they took a dump in the ring, and they left that. Sarita, one of the Hawks' favourite women's wrestlers of all time. She was hot and wrestled a lucha style. Unfortunately, her stay in TNA was too short, but she showed she was willing to play a number of roles to help make the show succeed. <laughs> Not gonna have my sleeve. I'm gonna screw her so hard she can have trouble walking. <laughs> oh my god. Oh, it was incredible. Incredible. No, it means the Young Bucks. They were not the finished product by any stretch at this time in their careers, but even so, they were doing incredible stuff in the ring that I'd never seen before. And whenever they faced the Motor City Machine Guns, you know you were about to witness a banger. They could have done even better, but reportedly had poor attitudes backstage and didn't want to learn from the veterans. If they had, they might have stuck around longer. Trinity A real highlight of the Asylum days in TNA. She looked like a million dollars, she flew around the ring like the Hawk, and she could actually cut a promo too. A total package. Sadly, there was no women's division at this time, and it harmed her chances. Listen, Scott, I'm not with Jeff. I'm not with anyone. I'm my own woman. But now that the man, Vince Russo, is back, it's my time to shine. Homicide. Always full of energy and believable in his role as a gang member. Homicide was a lot of fun. Jerry Lynn. Responsible for some of the best matches in the early days of TNA. Sadly, he faded after only a year where he really should have been a cornerstone of the company. Mickey James. She had two runs with TNA. The first, she took some insane hardcore bumps, but she looked goofier than Adam Cole on prom night. Her second run, she helped raise the levels of women in the company, and she's really become a bit of a legend in the company. P.T. Williams, a really fun high flyer and the man responsible for the Canadian Destroyer. At the time, it was the craziest move and people flew out of their seats in the crowd when they saw it. Despite how great he was in the ring, P.T. always struggled to connect with the audience. Cheerleader Melissa. She played a variety of roles for TNA, but most notably played Awesome Kong's handler, Raisha Saeed. She also did wrestle without a mask as Alyssa Flash and she had some really good matches in 2009. Quite an underappreciated woman. Abyss. I really toyed with this one too. He should be an A tier or not? I don't know. Let me know in the comments. Abyss was with TNA for many years and knocked a lot of years off his own life having hardcore matches for TNA. He was responsible for the most of the hardcore spots on the show and even had his own match, The Monster's Ball. The major issue with him is he was made to look so dumb over the years. They had him crying. They had him clapping like a seal. They had him trying to be Hulk Hogan's son. They had him terrified of Eric Bischoff. I just really struggled to take Abyss seriously. James Mitchell. Speaking of Abyss, his manager also scores highly. Jim Mitchell was a great devil-like character. He cut fire promos and did some great storyline stuff. My only gripe with him is, despite all the screen time he had, his biggest claim to fame is Abyss. Maybe he wasn't quite as good at managing as we thought. Brian Lawler. He was wacky and was a highlight in the early days of TNA. Boring was not in this man's DNA. Mike Bennett. Unexpectedly, he did really well in TNA and almost pushed into the main event scene. He had fun promos and storylines and I thought TNA should have actually done a bit more of him. 
Shannon Moore. Jeff Hardy's stoner friend was a consistent performer, sometimes stealing the show and reportedly did a lot behind the scenes to try and rein in Jeff Hardy's antics. A true stoner friend. Amazing Red. He had some of the most incredible moves of all time and it was just so much fun to watch him. Unfortunately he couldn't cut a promo to save his life and he wasn't really involved in storylines. Probably would have done a lot better in today's world. Taylor Wilde. Despite being at a sunglasses hut, she had some excellent matches and was also low-key hot. Scott Hall. The bad guy wasn't always having great matches in TNA. It was a bad time for him, but he was one of the few legit stars who joined Jarrett's promotion from the start. And I found he was trying hard in the beginning and later years he did his Elvis gimmick, which is hilarious. Hernandez. A consistent presence in the tag team division. A believable guy who could and would kick your ass if you looked at him the wrong way. Ric Flair. Flair in TNA was a lot of fun. He worked with a lot of the young guys like AJ and Lethal. He cut promos to the point where he was on the verge of having a heart attack. His face would turn redder than a tomato and to me it's a miracle this man is still alive today. You, the best selling author, father of the year, Couch Potato, want to wrestle Ric Flair? The answer is yes, you son of a bitch. Tara. Improved the knockouts division as she was a legit wrestler, but she also showed she had more of a feminine side in TNA. She had her fans and rightfully deserves a high spot on this list. Jim Cornette. Cornette wasn't just a writer, he was also an on-screen character. His exchanges with the wrestlers were always hilarious. He never outstayed his welcome and he was essentially an authority figure done right, the opposite of Bischoff. Rockstar Spud. He may have been smaller, but his personality was larger than life. He helped support a number of stars in their quest to become main eventers. He was a great supporting character. Elix Skipper. Responsible for some of the greatest early TNA matches and of course his notorious cage walk. He teamed up with Daniels and Loki as Triple X. Unfortunately, not much more to say about Skipper. Eric Young. He was with TNA for years and was a good combination of character work and wrestling ability. I would rank him higher, but the comedy really got overplayed and became seriously annoying. Douglas Williams, a veteran English wrestler that won a couple of titles and had excellent matches in TNA. He could also cut a half decent promo, it's just a shame he didn't stick around for longer. Ron Killings, a real shining star in the early days of TNA as he became the second man to capture the main belt. Unfortunately his star burnt out and they stopped using him. He was multi-talented as he could be intense, rap and dance. He went on to do Free Live Crew, which was also a lot of fun, but he was still underutilized. Sunday Superman, Ron Killings. One is Christmas time. Two, I wrote this rhyme. I'm trying to stop smoking. That's so hard. Then we tweaking it, beginning to make it a fake. Good Lord, and uh, she can't stop me. No one song. Happy holiday from TNA and Spike TV. Sonada. Here's a name I never get to talk about. First of all, he kind of reminds me of Taka Michinoku. He was so crisp in the ring, he also nearly made the X Division relevant again all on his own, which was no easy task, trust me. Samoa Joe. People are going to argue with me that Joe deserves to finish higher on this list. I do understand your argument. But what did Samoa Joe do after his first year and a half in TNA? Nothing. That's right. He had an incredible first year in wrestling as he went undefeated and feuded with Kurt Angle. Then, nothing. He managed to live on his past reputation for almost a decade. It's easy to blame management, but why did Joe keep signing new contracts? That's on him. He should be top tier, but he isn't. That Scott Hall no-showed this event tonight. But the fact of the matter is, he pumped out on me! And he pumped out on every single fan in this building tonight. Wow. We have superstars who come out here and not only screw us, the hardworking wrestlers of TNA, while others show up and pad their pensions. So I'll tell you what, Scott Hall, Chico, kiss my ass. You pumped out and you're a punk. Are you mad? Oh, go ahead fire me, I don't care. Kid Cash. The notorious KID played the character of a dick. Actually, I'm pretty sure that was his real personality. Still, I always had a lot of fun watching Kid Cash doing double springboard dives all over the ring. Lance Hoyt. For a time, Lance Hoyt was probably one of the most popular guys in the company. Then that time ended and he was just a generic big guy. 
He wrestled for TNA for quite a while and he remains pretty memorable. Oh, and who wants to get infected tonight? Maria. I'll never diss Maria because she does belong on TV. Yeah, she sucks in the ring, but you've got to have some variety in a wrestling show. She had a better promo than 95% of the TNA roster, and she looked better than 99% of them. She seems to be aging like a fine wine at this point. When she talked, you stood to attention and listened. She belonged on TV and she did a good job. Honestly, you are the worst assistant I have ever had. I have never had a problem with anybody else. Eli Drake. Underutilized at first, then they started to use him, but it was too late. The show was on its deathbed. The smart money is not to mess with any of it, and that's not an insult. That is just a fact of life. Chris Harris. Excellent in America's Most Wanted, and for years he also seemed like he could be a breakout single star. It all went downhill for Harris, though, and his career never recovered. The Pope. Possibly one of the most charismatic TNA wrestlers of all time. They thought he was an X-Division wrestler at first, but his fire promos moved him into the main event. He couldn't sustain it, and silly storylines ended him quicker than he began. Sanjay Dutt. Similar to Amazing Red, but not quite as fun in the ring, but a bit better at talking. Dave Penzer. Penzer on a pole match, someone book it. Rosemary. Really cool character work at first with her Decay faction, Abyss and Crazy Steve. For some reason, TNA were really reluctant to have her actually wrestle, and by the time they did it, it was too late, the show was dead. Crash Holly. Crash was doing this Mad Mikey thing in TNA. It was so much fun. He had this weekly vignette where he was angry about random stuff. He was so over the crowd in just a few weeks. I wish it had gone on longer because it was excellent and then he sadly passed away. I think it showed what a talent this guy was that he could get over in just a few weeks. ODB. She was something or someone completely different. She had this sort of trailer park drunk gimmick. It's hard to describe but it was sure memorable. Julio De Niro. Yeah, I'm ranking them above CM Punk. They were Ravens team The Gathering. I actually think Julio outshone Punk and got better crowd reactions. Not someone you ever hear about today. Desmond Wolf. Nigel McGuinness had an amazing feud with Kurt Angle, one of the best in TNA history. Then it was all downhill from there in less than a year. Things might have been different if he hadn't been ill. Roxy Laveau. This hardcore knockout was treated badly by TNA, but won the love of the fans. She even shaved herself bald after losing a match, which isn't something you'd expect wrestling bimbos of the 2000s to ever do. Hamada. Simply magnificent in the ring and the only other wrestler to use the famous cannon perk. Wish she'd stuck around for longer. Low key. This little nutcase was like a Jack Russell, flipping, biting and scratching all over you. I'm surprised TNA didn't do more of him. Was responsible for some of the greatest matches in the early days of TNA and he had this incredible voice when he cut a promo. It was strange how underused he was. Those old dinosaurs were fed to the wolves, and the wolves came out on top. Now, Vince Russo is in control to make the matches that will make the difference. Brooke Testmarker. Maybe I'm grading her slightly too high, but hear me out. She looked like a typical diva, but she showed that she did want to improve and learn in the ring. TNA had a really slow burn with her before eventually making her a champion. I'm surprised they didn't do more of her. It was frustrating at times. There can't have been many better looking women on TV. And let's be honest, no one's better in that ass. Which leads me on flawlessly to the next person. But first, make sure you subscribe to the Hort like a lackey, but don't look at my ass like Sonny Siaki. Yes, yeah, screw you if you don't agree, he's getting a B. One of my favourite characters in the early days of TNA. He could also have fun matches. Someone I wish they'd done more with. He really stood out from a lot of the bland people on the show at the time. I know you were checking out Sonny Siaki's ass. Don't ever check out Sonny Siaki's ass without Sonny Siaki's permission again. Of course, everybody knows Ace in the Hole, Sonny Siaki. David, I know the last few weeks, you and I haven't been getting along. And I know it's because I'm the guy with the good looks and the best body, and you're, well, you know, you're kind of fat and ugly. <laughs> Fatty. D'Lo Brown. He tried hard to show WWE what they'd been missing out on and he did well at first. He was the best example of an ex-WWE guy trying his hardest for TNA, but he faded over time. Goldilocks. She was one of the faces of TNA in the early days. She had attitude and she wasn't afraid to show it during her interviews. She was someone deserving to be on TV. Slash. 
The Slash Man really put his body on the line in the early days of TNA. He looked like a complete nutcase and he could go in the ring. The crowd liked him too. But that didn't seem to matter because TNA didn't seem to have much for him to do. New Jack. I admit I originally had Jack in the A tier, but I didn't want to damage the integrity of this list. He had some of the best TNA promos of all time and also took some of the biggest bumps in TNA history. But it was all over in a few months and I can't realistically say I could not imagine TNA without him. TNA would still have existed just fine without him. A lot of people didn't even realise he was in TNA. Queen Frosty! I got the white woman! I don't need this! I didn't volunteer to tag him to in the first place! I don't want to be in the ring with no damn fist and you... Okay, so we've reached the final characters, and if you've been following this video along the whole way at this point, you should start doing some maths. I'm not saying what kind of maths, and you should be doing that maths to work out who's made it to the most prestigious group of TNA wrestlers. These are the characters that I can't possibly imagine TNA without under any circumstances. They all contributed immensely in one way or another, and they're deserving of TNA legend status. But of course, if the Hawk missed anyone out who's deserving of being in the A-Zone, let me know in the comments. Christian Cage. A lot of ex-WWE wrestlers who turned up in TNA did basically nothing to help the show, but Christian was not one of those guys. He became a world champion, and he deserved it too. His matches were fun, and you wanted to see more. His promos were comedic yet relevant. He was always doing something important on the show, and I'm glad he was on the show. He wasn't with TNA for very long, but he's deserving of his place on this list for his contributions in the late 2000s. Jeff Jarrett. No, no, it's fine. I'm fine. Since returning for vacation, I have a more positive mindset because I am the Hulk. Despite my long-running feud with Slapnuts, I can accept that TNA literally wouldn't exist without him, so he has to be this top tier. Jarrett definitely overpushed himself with his reign of terror over the heavyweight title. He definitely became unbearable with his ref bumps, factions, guitar shots and long promos each week. But if you look more closely, there's definitely some excellent matches in there too. They are mostly against Kurt Angle, but it was a feud that went on for a couple of years. He annoys the crap out of me, but he's an old school heel whose only interest is to piss you off. Now I'm off to smash my computer with a brick. Angelina Love and Velvet Sky. Yeah, these two were not the best female wrestlers on the planet. That's aimed more at Velvet, by the way. But what they achieved cannot be ignored. They were often the highest drawing parts of an episode of TNA because the fans cared about them and wanted to see them. Why they wanted to see them, I'm sure you can imagine. Velvet especially was a typical Divas era wrestler. But the point is they were both trying to play that part. They loved being those people and they believed in it. They played the part of entitled mean brat girls. They always had screen time and Angelina turned out to be quite a good wrestler at the time. I can't imagine TNA without the beautiful people. Do you have any idea how experienced Velvet and I are, JB? We have spent many of our nights in every hotel you could ever imagine. <laughs> You're so gross anyways with those bulging eyes we may be the two new hot girls on the block but never ever underestimate what we can do in that bit wrestling ring alex shelley one half the motor seat machine guns alex shelley was the funnier member of the two he wasn't afraid to make himself look stupid for the fans because he understood his role but aside from the comedy he was a great wrestler all his stuff looked crisp, his offence was fun and fluid, and he is the inspiration for many high flyers today. Christopher Daniels. Daniels is deserving of his spot on this list despite not being my favourite wrestler ever. I used to just see him as somebody who could put on fun high flyer matches and nothing else. He never seemed to get immensely popular with the fans like his peers though. Something changed when he was paired up with Kaz and they stopped giving a damn. They ended up putting on some of the most entertaining segments in wrestling history as bad influence. Daniels was in TNA almost since day one and always gave his best for them. Despite that, he wasn't always treated the best by TNA. Jeremy Borash I certainly can't imagine TNA without Jeremy Borash. Originally, Borash was a Russo stooge from WCW who was carried over to TNA. But Borash turned out to be one of the hardest working guys in the company and outgrew Russo. He was also used as an on-screen interviewer and regularly got bullied by the wrestlers. He was a familiar, consistent face to the TNA show. It turned out he was contributing a lot to some of the best storylines behind the scenes too. Bobby Roode Roode started out as a tag guy of Team Canada and Beer Money, but something started to happen as he began to outshine his partners and opponents on the mic. It became clear he was destined for greater things. When he was the champion, he was primarily a heel champion, and he was known for his selfish generation. 
Great matches, great promos, great heel work, and he was with TNA for a very long time. Hogan, you coward! Hogan, you coward! Hey, you coward! Turn around and listen to me! You son of a bitch! Me and my buddies here built this company from scratch. Or how you and Bischoff and Flair cashed in on our blood, sweat, and tears over... Gail Kim. Gail Kim completely changed what women's wrestling meant. And she did it while still looking incredible. She really was the best of both worlds. She was a bit like the female Kurt Angle because she could drag a half-decent match out of anyone. She was the leader of the knockouts and she remains one of the most respected women's wrestlers of all time. Austin Aries. I'll keep it short, just like Aries. He had three runs with TNA. The first wasn't much to write home about, but for the second run he somehow became a main eventer just from his popularity and quality of his matches. A-Double was the main eventer that TNA never knew they were signing. He also carried TNA a lot through their darkest days. Bully Ray. He started out with his brother as Team 3D. This helped cast more eyes on the TNA product as they were familiar. Over the years, Bully outgrew his brother and it's clear that Devon was holding him back. Bully would often reference this in his promos, but it was actually true. He became Bully Ray. He got in much better shape, cut fire promos and had some great matches. His career rebirth was a thing of joy to behold. I was the star of Team 3D. Devon was a co-star. Devon always stood two steps behind me where he belonged. James Storm. Another guy who was in TNA from day one. He was primarily used as a tag team wrestler. And what a tag team guy he was. Both America's Most Wanted and Beer Money became integral parts of the TNA show. Storm also showed versatility to his character when he became a drunken heel in 2007. Possibly one of my favourite and funniest times watching wrestling. And he led two evil cults. Whilst they weren't great, the less said about them the better. At least he was trying. He also won the world title once and it should have been more. The cowboy had immense backing for the fans and was just a lot of fun to watch. This is it. Triple A. This is us. No, no, this no, no, no. Hello and welcome everyone to the 8.30 closed meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. Hi, my name is Lydia and I'm an alcoholic. My name's James. Yeah. And after listening to you pathetic people, I gotta have beer. Give it to me, James. Well, we discourage drinking. We don't encourage drinking. Don't you know alcoholism is a disease? A disease? My mama taught me. If you're gonna have a disease, it should be one that you're gonna have a good time with. Awesome Kong. What to say that's not already been said. Ditto Gail Kim. She showed that women's wrestling could be about talent rather than a different sort of talent. Kong gave you a reason to buy the pay-per-view, even though she was a woman. And I'm not being sexist. At the time, women's wrestling consisted of rolling around on the mat, mostly wrapped in dental floss. Scott Steiner. When I wrote this list, I had to ask myself, could I carry on living without the Steiner TNA promos in my life? I decided yes, but I wouldn't be a wrestling fan today. The majority of the time, you didn't want to see Steiner have a match. It was more the craziness that he'd do on the mic. Anyone who's coming up in the wrestling world should analyse these promos and try to capture some of the magic. Aside from that, there were actually decent feuds with Samoa Joe and Bobby Lashley during this time, which I would recommend checking out. Steiner was in and out of TNA a lot throughout the years, but it was always a better place when he was there. Who is that? Crystal. You think that's the first time she's been on my chest? And I'm gonna knock you out too! Are you talking about the Sun Miles? He's, he's two. No, he's one and a half. See, that's what's great about me. I don't discriminate against age. I'll beat anybody up! He lied to me! There's no lying in wrestling! Kurt Angle. Some people may view Kurt Angle as Mr. TNA, and that's fine, I understand that. In this hoax opinion, no one else put on so many good matches in TNA. It didn't matter who Kurt was facing, he managed to drag good match out of them. Kurt gave you a reason to buy the pay-per-views because you never knew what crazy stunt he was going to pull on the show. He became my favourite wrestler of all time during his TNA run when I realised just how much a Kurt Angle match meant to me. The effort this man put in was insane. He actually hung around in TNA for longer than most whilst the company died, so respect for that too. Matt Hardy. Yeah, for once in his life, Matt has finished above his brother Jeff at something. And deservedly so too. Matt tried out a few different characters during his TNA run, showing that he still had drive and love for the business to succeed. He eventually settled on Broken Matt and his broken brilliance and pretty much saved TNA. For a brief time, he did the impossible and he got people watching TNA at a time when everyone assumed they were already finished. Sting. How can I make these rankings not include the icon Sting at the top? His matches weren't the most flashy, long or memorable. He was more than that. 
Him joining TNA in the first place gave them an audience of WCW fans, but it would turn out that Sting was not just here to collect a paycheck. A lot of his time in TNA was actually very storyline heavy, probably a good idea for an ageing wrestler. He had memorable feuds with Jarrett, Samoa Joe, Kurt Angle and Hogan. He showed that he still had drive too when he overhauled his character and became Joker Sting. Even in the twilight of his career, he wasn't half arsing it because he was in TNA. I respect Sting for his contributions to TNA. Bonding time with the Hulkster. Hey, let's do some vitamins now, okay? Come here. No, no come on. Breathe. You can do it. Broken. Bobby Lashley. Lashley had two spells with TNA, and although the first wasn't much to write home about, the second one sure would be. He showed everyone why the WWE invested so much time in him in the first place, as he dominated his opponents, putting on great matches, and being a 100% believable badass at all times. It turned out he just needed a mouthpiece, and he mostly let his ring work speak for him. Lashley certainly gave me a reason to watch at a time when the company was dying. Without him, it would have felt like you were watching an indie show. Dixie Carter I'm aware I'm probably responsible for stoking a lot of the hate that this woman gets, but let me tell you this, I wouldn't be here talking to you if it wasn't for Dixie Carter. No, she isn't my mum. Probably a good thing because half the internet seems to want to sleep with her. She injected a lot of funds into TNA at a time when the Slapnuts family were failing. Because of her family, we've got the whole selection of stars crossing the line and we've given a viable alternative to the WWE. Yes, she had an intolerable voice, she couldn't act, and she came across as the dumbest businesswoman alive, but we still have to give thanks to Dixie Carter. Mike Tanay and Dom West. One of the most consistent parts of TNA programming was the announced team of West and Tanay, who were both on the headsets from the start until about 2009. Dom West was moved on so that Taz could take up his role, and in hindsight, that wasn't a good idea. I strongly believe in continuity, and changing the announced team was something that just wasn't needed. But TNA saw Taz as a star. Tanay was an announcer in WCW before, but for West, he was new to the gig. Internet fans did start to voice their displeasure about how excited Don West was about TNA on every show. Then we got Taz who thought TNA was a joke. Be careful what you wish for. Don West recently passed away. For more information, check out the full video I made about the man. You're nothing but a selfish prick! Monty Brown. Monty should have been more for TNA, sadly he wasn't, but he remains to be a true example of someone rising up through the card through the sheer organic crowd reactions he was getting. When you first watch Monty, he seems a bit weird, the way he wipes his face on the ropes and he's sniffing all the time. No, he didn't have a drug problem, he was in fact from the Serengeti and he was marking his territory. A Monty Brown promo will keep you listening and in shock at the energy and vocabulary of this man, truly a work of art. He could back it up in the ring too, but unfortunately TNA didn't want to push him because slap nuts. The alpha male, or let me change the vernacular, you D-Lo, the alpha male, I am the supreme being, I don't care if it's Ken Shamrock, Lion's Den, there's only one lion in that den, and he's the alpha male, I wouldn't care if it's b I wouldn't care about the truth, this is the truth. EC3. For me, Ethan Carter III was probably the third biggest homegrown star after Bobby Roode and someone else. It's just a shame he ended up with that name because it wouldn't help him in the future. Ethan debuted as the snot-nosed sport, rich punk nephew of Dixie Carter, but he was incredibly jacked and able to cut strong promos. So it wasn't long before EC3 became a multiple-time TNA heavyweight champion. His entrance music is iconic and he got people excited to see him. Often EC3 gets negativity as he kind of became the TNA guy after Styles left and those were some big boots to fill. Plus, the show was on a massive decline and lots of people didn't even see EC3's rise at the company. And then he just went a bit weird. But nobody can take away how important he was to TNA when the company was dying and they needed a cheap, reliable star. Shark Boy. Maybe I'm being a bit too nice putting Sharky in this spot, but to the people who think I am, I say, shut up or I'll smack you one. Sharkboy was in TNA almost since the start, and therefore he's one of the first people you think of in TNA. His image was completely different to anything else at the time. He started doing a gimmick where he was a shark that for some reason thought it was Stone Cold Steve Austin. People call this hokey and a rip-off. Let me tell you this, brother. His impressions got some of the biggest reactions in company history. He didn't have the most crazy move set, but everything he did got the crowd to make noise. He was one of those people who worked smarter, not harder. He was an X-Division guy who didn't do flips, but he was still loved. Shows what strong character work can do for a wrestler. Well, hell yeah. The next time you stick that thermometer up my ass, there's going to be hell to pay, you son of a bitch. And that's the bottom line, because Shark Boy said so. 
Chris Saban. Saban started out as an X-Division guy and TNA saw potential in him because they put the belt on him almost straight away. He had this kind of dickish, cocky personality to him, but he still wanted to cheer him. He could pull off moves that nobody had seen in the 2000s, and he was certainly someone who gave you a reason to watch the show. His tag team with Alex Shelley continued in the same vein, and although they were never given the push they deserved, they always put on a great show. The tag division without the guns just wouldn't have been worth watching. The only dark spot on Saban's career is when they tried to give him the world title, which just didn't work. I'm sorry, but nobody was buying it. Luckily, he still had the respect of the fans, and he's actually working for Impact to this day. And finally, AJ Styles, Mr. TNA. I never quite realised since I started this channel how many people quit watching the show when AJ left. He was the first person you thought of when it came to TNA. He was there since day one. He never took any lengthy breaks away from the company, and he was the biggest homegrown star they had. He was responsible for several of the best matches in company history, and he was often the reason you purchased a pay-per-view. Despite his lack of pro ability, he still managed to connect with the audience. Kids, women and adult males all adored him, and the day he left was the darkest day in the company. TNA just didn't make sense without him. If in some crazy world they had managed to hold on to him, things could be different right now. And that's the list, let the hope know if I missed anything out. Was there anyone deserving of being in the top tier that I was too harsh on? Was I too nice to some people who deserve to be in the zone? It's time to make your voice heard, and if you don't, you're a turd. It needs to be shoved, 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 it needs to be shoved.